So The Queen's Gambit needs absolutely no introduction. We've all seen it, most of us love it, and a few people even bought chess boards because of it. But the chances are that if you were recommended it by a friend, you were a little bit apprehensive at first because they likely would have described it as being about some girl who's really good at chess. That sounds like a really boring premise, but having watched the show, we know that it's not. And that's because the show isn't really about chess, or at least it is, but it's about so much more than that as well and it's with this subtext that the show keeps its audience engaged. But just before I begin this channel is Wyvo Joe where I think a bit too much about film, politics and history. If that's your cup of tea, which I assume it is because you're here, why not click subscribe and ring the bell and then you know the next time I make a video. Okay, so what subtext? Well, essentially, if we think of text as what we're actually viewing on screen, subtext is the layer of meaning underneath it. In The Queen's Gambit, chess is the text and Beth's goals and emotions are the subtext. We watch her play the game and through that, we gain a greater understanding of who she is as a character. Subtext is displayed by mise-en-scene, which is essentially just a pretentious way of saying everything we see on screen, whether that be cinematography, performance, costume, whatever. Essentially, when this is done well, it can create a sort of visual shorthand for the audience. As Robert McKee said in Story, the best tip for writing film dialogue is don't. Never write dialogue when you can instead come up with a visual expression. Now, obviously, The Queen's Gambit does have dialogue, but the cinematography and performance show Beth's desires in a much more interesting way. Take Beth and Towns' game, for example. From the second that these two meet, you can tell that they fancy each other. She doesn't walk into the room and call him a fitty or anything like that, but you know. You know there's something going on. And this would have been a directorial choice. Okay, Anya. Yes? Call voice guy. Okay, so today in our scene, we're gonna need you to play chess, okay? Okay. Well, that doesn't seem so hard. But... You're in love. Oh my. Oh! I've never been in love before. This is clear from the second that Beth walks into the room. We see Towns from her perspective in an intimate close-up, which confirms that he is indeed a handsome man. She moves a little bit awkwardly, a bit more interested in him than the game that she's obsessed with. When they sit down, they keep glancing at each other, they touch their lips when they talk. Essentially, we know, right? We No one has to say anything, but we know. And it's disgusting. So why do it like this? Well, for starters, it's a bit more realistic because no one just goes around saying exactly what they want all of the time because that would be absolutely bizarre. For another thing, it adds an extra layer of drama to the game. Very few people want to watch a chess match played out in real time. However, we are all a bunch of little gossip hunters and we're very interested in who fancies who. And because we know Beth and we're invested in her story, we want her to succeed in this. The tension in the scene is not whether or not Beth wins the chess game, because we know that she has to. She wouldn't be much of a chess prodigy if she lost in the second episode. However, it becomes much more about whether or not she gets together with Towns, or at least whether or not he learns to respect her. Therefore, the scene doesn't build to a foregone conclusion of her winning the game, but instead to Towns complimenting her, and this makes it a lot more satisfying because of the subtext. As Robert McKee said, when we root for a main character, it's because we identify our own desires with that of that protagonist. And it's a lot more universal to have someone who you want to impress than it is to have someone who you want to beat at chess. The third reason is that it sets up an internal thought process for Beth. She can't just go around spouting exactly what she wants and nor would we want her to because it's a lot more fun as an audience if we can infer what's gonna happen next. And it also makes us more active and engaged viewers. Take, for example, when she first sees Benny Watts at a tournament and he's demonstrating chess moves. Now, this is another potentially boring scene, but as we see, it sort of develops a story because Beth guesses what Benny's going to do next, but then so does everyone else around her. There we go. The story's developed. She's now playing against people who are at her level and she's worried about what's going to happen next. And so we are as well. So let's move on to the most important place that this subtext is used, those being Beth's games against Borgov. Borgov doesn't show up until halfway through the series and even then he doesn't really speak to Beth. We know that in the first six episodes he's intellectually superior to her and we also know there's this whole Cold War thing going on in the background but neither of these make him a particularly effective antagonist. 
right? We know that Beth's going to beat him in the end, and we don't really care about the Cold War Soviet thing unless you're a person like me, and therefore we have to find another way to engage the audience. If the whole series was just Beth gets really good at chess and then beats the Soviet, we'd be like, you know, so what? Beth's ability to defeat Borgov is directly linked to her character development. Screen Rant sums this up quite well by saying throughout the series Beth learns self-esteem, she learns to make connections and she also learns humility as well which is the most important of all. Now chess is not the only thing which allows her to do this but it is a very important part in something which begins the healing process. And this is kind of the key point here because we care about Beth and so we want to see her heal and this is what makes Borgov an effective antagonist because the only way that she can defeat him is when she overcomes her addictions and learns humility. And the relationship between the two of them is also important but it's not developed through hour-long conversations and rooms which wouldn't really be realistic for a US and Soviet chess champion but instead it is just developed through subtle subtext which is laced throughout their games. In the first game, Borgov strides in and shakes her hand. She stays sitting and moves in a really jerky way which shows her petulance. He meticulously prepares his pieces and then they start to play. We can see straight away that Beth is no match for him because she glances at him nervously throughout the game while he doesn't give her a second look. When she moves a piece, she does it timidly. When he does it, he does it with confidence. She's lost. She knows that she's lost, we know that she's lost, and Borgov is completely nonplussed by her. And this pisses us off because we think that Beth is someone who he should really be plussed about. The performances show us that Beth needs to beat him, but that she also needs to earn his respect. The second game comes when Beth is really struggling with addiction. This time she's older, so she shows a little bit more maturity by staying standing to shake his hand. She's also started to garner a little bit of respect from him by speaking Russian at a press conference, which she smiles at. But she's still moving jerkily, so there's still a level of petulance, and there's also the factor of her addictions. We're shown this because we don't watch the match from the board like we were before, but instead from this weird pegboard that looks like it's out of a Wes Anderson film. When she pours herself water, she does it with both hands, so we know that she's in an absolute state, and Borgov is completely stone-faced. We know that she's going to lose again. When she resigns the game, we see that she's still not fully mature. She isn't gracious in defeat, but instead furious, and she storms off without shaking Borgov's hand. Again, imagine how boring it would be if it was just Beth playing chess against someone who she's already lost to. In this way, we can see and feel her embarrassment, we can see the obstacles, and we can also see that Borgov is still withholding respect from her. And this makes it all the more satisfying when she does eventually beat him. In the final game, the tables turn on Borgov. We see his eyes flickering all over the board. He keeps blinking, but we see Beth shot from a low position, looking down over the board, the master of her domain. And then Borgov concedes in English, going down to her level. It's your game. Take it. He finally gives her respect and recognition. He applauds her and hugs her. She has won the game, but it's so much more than that. She's basically won at life. In case we're in doubt that she was only humble in victory, she then goes out to a random park in Russia and plays some random bearded man who absolutely revels in his chance to play the new world champion. In success, she extends courtesy to others that wasn't given to her as she teases the man and speaks to him in Russian. Sagrayam. How else can I conclude except for to say that The Queen's Gambit is a really good show, Anya Taylor-Joy is a bloody good actress and she really sells Beth to us in a way which makes us understand her and through the way that she conveys the subtext as well she makes the show much more compelling than it has any right to be. Thank you so much for watching. As I said at the beginning, this is Wybo Joe. It's a channel where I talk about, you know, history, politics, film and stuff like that. I'm probably going to go more into the history and uh, politics side at the moment. But if that's your cup of tea, which I assume it is, why not just click subscribe and ring the bell and you know the next thing I'm going to get up to. As for what comes next, I'm not really sure. There's a lot of stuff going on in Myanmar, so I might have a little dig into that like I did with my Hong Kong video. Um, or I might go into Red Herrings in Bridgerton, it sort of depends how I feel once I'm done editing this.